Good afternoon. It is my great pleasure to introduce Nobel laureate Dr. William Phillips for his talk, How We Measure Up the Revolutionary Changes to the Way Science Measures Almost Everything. Dr. Phillips earned his PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1976, and after two years as a Heim Wesman, Wiseman postdoctoral fellow at MIT, he joined the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, NIST, known at that time as the National Bureau of Standards, to work on precision electrical measurements and fundamental concepts. There he initiated a new research program to cool atomic gases with laser light. He founded NIST's Laser Cooling and Trapping Group and later was a founding member of the Joint Quantum Institute. His research group has been responsible for developing some of the main techniques now used for laser cooling and cold atom experiments in laboratories around the world. Based on the work of this group, atomic fountain clocks are now the primary standards for world timekeeping, and lattice-trapped atoms are considered likely candidates for future primary frequency standards. Among the group's current research directions are the use of ultra-cold atoms for quantum information processing and quantum simulation of important physical problems. Dr. Phillips received the 1997 Nobel Prize in Physics for the development of methods to cool and trap atoms with laser light, along with Dr. Stephen Chu from Stanford University and Dr. Claude Cohen-Tanucci from the École Normale Supérieure in France. Their finding led to some of the most important technologies of modern atomic physics and are used today by researchers in various applications. These three researchers working independently discovered new experimental results that surpassed the predictions of existing theories of laser cooling. It is one of those rare instances in physics where experiments have worked better than anticipated and is a tribute to careful experimentation. We are so honored to have Dr. Williams with us today, and he will recount the history of measurement of units from ancient to modern times and how the international scientific community became free of artifacts. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Phillips. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, all that stuff that you heard about laser cooling and, uh, and stuff like that, that's not what I'm going to talk about at all today. So um, if you want to hear about that, and it's a really exciting story, um, you'll have to come back sometime maybe in the spring, and we'll have another talk, and I'll, uh, I'll even do some demonstrations that involve blowing stuff up and levitating things, and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. But today is something rather different. In fact, uh, I'm going to be talking about some of the things that I worked on when I first came to uh, the National Bureau of Standards some 45 years ago, uh, and something that still interests me and, and that I find really, uh, uh, really exciting. Um, so, uh, how we measure up. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, emphasize again that I'm part of the Joint Quantum Institute, which is joint between NIST and the University of Maryland. And uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be part of the laser cooling and trapping group. Uh, Gretchen Campbell is my group leader, uh, Paul Lett, Trey Porto, Ian Spielman, Ida Tietzinger, Charles Clark, Paul Julian, and Nicole Younger Halpern are the other members of that group, and it's a, a tremendous pleasure and honor to work with them on a daily basis. So, I want you to think of questions as we go along. Because as was mentioned at the end, uh, we're gonna have a question period. But more importantly, I'm gonna give everyone who asks a, present, who asks a question a prize. So, uh, so, so, so think about the questions. Uh, if I were you, I would have to write them down because 
I just turned 75, and you know, by the time the lecture is over, I've forgotten the question that I had from the beginning of the lecture, uh, but that's just a suggestion. Okay, how we measure up. Okay, so people have said over the years that science is about what we can measure. In fact, uh, Lord Kelvin said, when you measure something, uh, uh, then you, you really know what you're talking about. You can express it in numbers. You know something about it. Uh, and to express the results of our measurements, we have to have units. And the metric system is the system of units that the world has agreed upon that we're going to measure things in so we can communicate with each other. And the um, metric system had its birth uh, with, the, with the French Revolution. And part of the story that I'm going to tell you about today is that on the 20th of May, uh, 2019, I'm sure you recognize the 20th of May as being World Metrology Day. I mean, everybody gets really excited when the 20th of May comes along uh, because it celebrates the science of measurement. But on the 20th of May, 2019, we have experienced the biggest uh, revolution in measurement since the French Revolution. So what is the nature of that revolution? Well, the metric system, the formal name of the metric system is the International System of Units, the Système International d'Unité, or SI for short. And uh, it consists of seven base units that are used to express everything that we want to measure, everything else that we want to measure. So those base units are the kilogram, the meter, the second, the ampere, probably things you're pretty familiar with, uh, the Kelvin, the unit of temperature, uh, the mole, the unit of, of amount of substance, of chemical substance, and the candela, which is a measure of brightness or luminous intensity or something, I forget what it's called. But you know, it's, uh, uh, it's the thing that, that, that um, uh, when you buy a light bulb, it tells you how many lumens it is, and lumens are related to candelas. Anyway, that's, those are the seven units, and everything that we measure is based on them. If we want to measure volume in liters, it's based on, on, uh, on this set of, of units. The revolution that I'm going to tell you about is that today, in contrast to the way things have been for most of the history of the metric system, each one of these units the, the, the definition of what a meter means, of what a second means, the definition is based on fixing the value of a fundamental constant of nature. Now, you might think, how can that be? Or what does that even mean to say that I fix the value of a fundamental constant of nature and use that to fix uh, a unit? Well, in order to explain that, I want to tell you about an earlier unit, namely the second, um, and uh, with apologies to the late, great Stephen Hawking, I'm going to do this by bringing you uh, my version of A Brief History of Time. So since time immemorial, since we've had seconds, the second was defined to be a certain fraction of a day. Now a day has 24 hours and 60 minutes per hour, 60 seconds per, uh, per minute. So that means that a second is one day divided by uh, 86,400, the product of 60 times 60 times 24. That's what a second is. And I think everybody thinks of that as being what a second is. Well, it used to be, but it's not anymore. Why? Because by the turn of the century, by which I don't mean 2000, I mean 1900, <laughs> by the turn of that century, people had figured out that the rotation of the Earth is not constant. All kinds of things mess up the rotation of the Earth. The tides are constantly slowing down the Earth. Every time there is an earthquake, uh, it redistributes the mass of the Earth, and that changes the, the rotation speed. If ocean currents, like the Gulf Stream, change a little bit. That changes the angular momentum of the, the, the water in, in the Earth, and the rotation of the Earth has to adjust because of the, the conservation of angular momentum, certainly something all of you physics students uh, know about. So they had to come up with a, a better definition that would satisfy the increasingly severe demands of, of measurement science, of, of metrology. And one of the ways, and the way we, we use today, 
uh, is an atomic clock. So here is a really oversimplified version of how an atomic clock works. So imagine you've got an atom. Now I've indicated this is a cartoon version of an atom. There are two lines on here to indicate that the atom has two energy levels. It has a lot more, but we only care about two. And what are those two energy levels? Well, the atom is cesium. And if you remember from your high school chemistry, cesium is an alkali uh, atom. And it's got one unpaired electron. And that electron is sitting out here. That's a lie. The electron isn't sitting out here. It's in a cloud described by a wave function. But let's not go into that. OK? So, so let me continue with the lie. There's an electron sitting out here. And there's a nucleus here. And they're both spinning. And they both, uh, because they're charged and they're spinning, they create a magnetic field. And the magnetic field of the electron is felt at the nucleus. And if the electron flips over, then the magnetic field changes direction. That changes the energy of the whole atom. And that energy difference is uh, what we call the hyperfine frequency. And for cesium, it is exactly this number, 9 point something gigahertz, OK? a microwave frequency. Now, why do I say it's exactly that number? Because we have defined it to be that number. And by defining it to be that number, we have defined what we mean by a second. A second is this number of you know, 9 billion cycles of the radiation that corresponds to the energy difference between this electron being up and the electron being down. And, what, and the way you do this is you get yourself a bunch of cesium atoms, you shine in microwaves, and if they have just the right frequency, it flips the electron. And you can tell that. There's a number of ways we can tell the electron flipped. So that's the oversimplified version of an atomic clock. You get some atoms, you put them into a certain state, you shine microwaves on, and if the microwaves have just the right frequency, which is that number right there, the electron will flip its spin, and then you know that the microwaves have that frequency. And this is the current definition of the second. That the second is the duration of 9 billion something periods of that radiation. And that was done in 1967, before a lot of you were born. <laughs> so a second has not been related to the rotation of the Earth for a really long time, because that just wasn't good enough for the kinds of measurements that we need to make. Here is a picture of a, uh, an atomic clock out in Boulder, Colorado, where the uh, uh, atomic time standards for the civilian sector of the United States are located. Uh, the, uh, uh, the military time is located at the US uh, Naval Observatory, which is very close to here. I'm very proud of the fact that the people at the Naval Observatory who make their atomic clocks were all postdocs in my lab. <laughs> uh, so here's Don Meekoff and Steve Jeffords out in Boulder. And uh, they cool using the techniques of laser cooling that I'm not going to tell you about. Uh, they cool these atoms, these cesium atoms, down to one millionth of a degree above absolute zero using the techniques that we developed in our laboratory and uh, uh, using those uh, uh, really cold atoms, they keep time to a few parts in 10 to the 16. This is the most accurately uh, uh, measured quantity in the, in the international system of units, a few parts in 10 to the 16. But you know what? We're not satisfied. We're doing better. We're going to get it to a part in 10 to the 18 and redefine what we mean by a second. But that's a story yet to come. So what we have done in this very short summary is we have gone from something that is essentially an artifact. The Earth, I mean, there's nothing special about the Earth except that that's where we live. Uh, there's nothing special about its rotation frequency other than that's what it is and it doesn't change much, but it does change. Uh, we've gone from that, which is a totally arbitrary definition of the second, to something that is based on a constant of nature, the energy difference between two states of an atom, between two uh, directions in which the electron might, uh, the electron spin might, might be pointing. And 
the fact that this has a particular value is related to quantum mechanics, which I'm not going to tell you about, but happy to ask, answer questions about because I love quantum mechanics. It's such a beautiful, a beautiful subject. But this is the key idea here, that we went from something that was rather arbitrary and and subject to change to something that is not subject to change, something that is based on a constant of nature, namely the energy levels in, in an atom. This idea, uh, which is part of the 20th century and the 21st century, was anticipated by physicists of the 19th century, like Kelvin and Maxwell. Kelvin said, and you wonder, how did he, how did he come up with this? Recent discoveries indicate that natural pieces of matter such as atoms of hydrogen or sodium, readily available in, in infinite numbers, are all absolutely identical in every physical property. And these are the things that he's saying should be used uh, as, uh, as a standard of time. This was at a time in history when most people didn't even believe in atoms. It wasn't until early in the 20th century with the work of, of Einstein and Perrin that people were finally convinced that matter is made up of atoms. And yet in the 19th century, not only does Kelvin confidently talk about these atoms, but he understands the property of these atoms are absolutely the same for every atom of the same kind. Something that is still a bit of a mystery to us today, but he, but he was right. <laughs> and uh, uh, just, you know, what a guy. Now, an even better story. This I'm going to call a short history of length. The first standards of length, whoops, were based on the human body. A foot was a foot, right? Uh, a fathom was your arm span. Uh, a, a yard was the distance between your nose and the end of your finger when you stretched it out. A hand, typically used to measure the height of horses, was a hand. <laughs> Okay, so this was really convenient because it meant you always had your standard of measurement with you. Uh, the trouble with it was it's not very consistent. Uh, if you were buying fabric from a short fabric merchant, maybe you wouldn't get the amount of fabric that you had expected to get uh, uh, when, you, when you went shopping. Uh, so one solution was to not use the, uh, the body of whoever was was doing the, uh, the selling or, or, or measuring, but to use a specific body. Uh, so in ancient Egypt, that was the body of the pharaoh. And the, uh, uh, the royal cubit was the, based on the size of the pharaoh's forearm. And uh, uh, now, you didn't always have the pharaoh around, right, when you were, say, building a pyramid. So what they did was they, they enshrined the, the length of the pharaoh's forearm in a stone uh, artifact, a stone standard, and that became the royal cubit for all of Egypt. And out in the field, people who were the engineers who were, were building the, uh, the, uh, the pyramids uh, were using wooden standards that they had to calibrate against the stone standard every month under pain of death. So these people were really serious about their metrology, and the uh, result of, of being that serious about the metrology was that the, the pyramids were made really well. Uh, the, uh, the baselines are consistent to a tiny fraction of a percent. They're square to 12 seconds of arc. But this idea of using an artifact as a length standard uh, was uh, widespread uh, even by the, uh, by, by, by the Middle Ages, uh, in Europe, uh, every town had one of these standards of length often cemented into uh, the wall in the town square so that everybody would have access to it. Trouble was that it often would vary from one town to the next. So here is uh, uh, the town of, I think this is Regensburg, Yes, this is Regensburg, and you can see that a fathom in Regensburg is a pretty good, a pretty good fathom, probably a good place to buy fabric. Uh, but if you were to go into one of the towns of nearby uh, Bavaria, you would get uh, a completely different measure. So 
uh, this was great for people who didn't travel, but, uh, but not so wonderful if you wanted to compare measurements from one place uh, in Europe or even in the same country to another place. Well, the French revolutionaries figured that along with reforming uh, politics, they would reform measurement as well. And they decided in the spirit of, what is it, uh, fraternité, égalité, liberté, that they were going to have a standard of length that would be available to everyone in the world. So they said they would use the world itself as the standard of length. And the meter, the, this new idea of a standard of length, was defined to be one ten millionth of the distance from the North Pole to the equator on a line that ran through Paris, just to make sure that it was completely universal, you wanted to go through Paris. Um, and, and, and they sent out surveyors to determine what that distance was. They only went from uh, uh, Barcelona to, um, uh, I think it was Dunkirk, uh, and extrapolated for the rest of the Earth. But you know, it took them several years. There was wars going on. You know, this was during the French Revolution and various other wars. So they had a lot of trouble. But, um, uh, but, but they were pursuing this idea, this revolutionary dream of uh, having something that would be good for all time for all people instead of something that uh, would be based on, on uh, uh, the size of, of someone's body. In fact, they, they uh, uh, minted these coins to sort of illustrate this idea. Here's a, a mythological figure with calipers measuring the earth, which is what they actually did with these surveyors. So these surveyors come back with all of their data, and now they know what a meter is in terms of the old systems of measurement. And what do they do? They make an artifact because you know you can't send out surveyors every time you want to make a, a measurement. So they made an artifact. This is called the meter of the archives. It was deposited in the archives of France in 1799, and uh, the distance between the ends of this bar uh, was exactly one meter by definition for the country of France. Now later. Uh, the countries of the world got together and decided they would adopt the meter as uh, their standard of measurement, and they created a new meter bar uh, based on that meter of the archives. Uh, there was a famous treaty in 1875, and they decided that, that they would make this bar, and they put two scratches on it that were one meter apart. And this was the definition of the meter for the entire world until 1960. Now, in 1960, well, actually much earlier than 1960, people had figured out that you could use the wavelength of light to make much better measurements than you could make with uh, a meter bar like this. So this is a cartoon of what uh, is called an interferometer. You take beams of light, you take a beam of light, and you split it up so that part of it uh, uh, goes this way and part of it goes that way and then mirrors bounce it back and the two beams of light interfere with each other and produce a pattern that looks like this. Now here's the, the amazing part of this. If you take this movable mirror and move it by one quarter of a wavelength, a quarter of a, length of a wavelength of light is really, really small. It's like, uh, a, uh, it, it's smaller than, than one quarter of one millionth of a meter, okay? You do that and it'll change this spot here from being bright to being dark, which is really easy to tell. So in other words, you can really easily tell that you've moved this mirror by a tiny fraction of, uh, of one millionth of a meter. The scratch is 20 me millionths of a meter wide and you've got to find the center of a scratch so you can see that, that this light business was a much better way of, of doing length, but it took them until 1960 to change the definition because the metrology community is really conservative and they don't make changes very lightly. Uh, once again, uh, Kelvin and Maxwell had it right. Maxwell said that the most universal standard of length would be the wavelength of a particular kind of light 
such that uh, such a standard would be independent of any changes in the dimensions of the earth, and getting a little bit funny here, he says, and should be adopted by those who expect their writings to be more permanent than that body. <laughs> Okay, so maybe not very many people's work is going to outlive the, the earth itself, but it can certainly outlive the, uh, uh, the possible changes to the dimensions of the earth as, you know, earthquakes and, and whatever happen, and in any case would be something that would be accessible to everybody. So in 1960, they said that this kind of a lamp uh, this glass uh, vessel has krypton gas inside it, and when it's excited with an electric current, it makes an orange light, and the wavelength of that orange light was defined to be a particular value. So that was the new definition of the meter, and it follows our uh, general idea that instead of having an artifact, the distance between two scratches on a metal bar, let's have something that depends upon uh, the the way the world works, the, the, uh, a, a constant of, of nature, which is the wavelength of, of this krypton light. Now, 1960, an auspicious year, because in that year, the laser was invented. And it didn't take long before people had lasers that were putting out light that was much more pure in its wavelength than the light that comes from this krypton lamp. This krypton lamp produces a mixture of different wavelengths, not a very broad mixture, but still a mixture, whereas a laser puts out a single wavelength. And it didn't take too long before people were using lasers like this as de facto standards. In other words, they had something that worked better than the lamp that was used to define what we mean by a meter, and they started using that even though it wasn't the legal definition of the, uh, of the meter. So by 1983, people had decided we better change the definition. You know, it only took them a little bit more than 20 years to figure that out. Uh, we better change the definition. And the obvious thing to do would have been to say, okay, our new definition of the meter is that the wavelength of the light coming out of this laser is some particular value. That would have been the most obvious thing to do. Fortunately, they did not do the obvious thing. They did something that was far more beautiful. They defined the speed of light. How does that do anything for you? Because of this universal relationship, that the speed of light is equal to the wavelength of the light times its frequency. Light is just an electromagnetic wave that waves back and forth at some frequency, some really high frequency, a few times 10 to the 14 times per second in, uh, uh, for visible light. But this is true for any wavelength of light, for any frequency of light. It's true for any wave phenomenon. So what that means is that if you could measure the frequency of the light, and if you define what the speed of light is, you know what its wavelength is, and you've got a ruler that's got its tick marks at uh, a spacing of the wavelength of light, which is a fraction of a millionth of a meter. And in 1983, people had learned how to measure the frequency of light. And so they said that the meter, the new definition of the meter is the length that uh, light goes in one over 299 million blah, blah, blah of a second. And what that does is it takes this number and defines that as being the speed of light in meters per second. So that new definition was to define the speed of light. The beauty of this definition is if somebody makes a better laser, if somebody develops a method for measuring the frequency that's better than the old method, it's already incorporated into this definition. So as long as we take that idea we should never have to change the definition. So now we've gone from an artifact to a constant of nature to a fundamental constant of nature, the speed of light, something that transcends any particular atom, uh, any particular color of light. And this is, is really the way to go because, as I said, there should never be any need to change. Now we get to modern times. We want to use this same idea to redefine the kilogram, and for that matter, the ampere, the Kelvin, and the mole. And 
Why have we been so eager to do this? And how have we done it? That's what I'm going to talk about next. OK. A light history of mass. <laughs> Here are some stones from ancient Babylonia. They range in weight from a mina to three shekels. I don't even remember which one is which. But <laughs> you may recognize the shekel as being a, uh, a unit of weight. Uh, so the ancient Babylonians were doing what people have done for all these other things. They used an artifact. They made these stones. And this was great, except for the fact that somebody else's set of stones might not be exactly the same as yours. So a shekel of some precious metal in one place might not be equal to a shekel of precious metal someplace else. So what do you do? Well, the French revolutionaries had the answer. They were going to use this uh, new definition of a meter to define volume and, uh, and from volume, mass. What they did was they said that one kilogram, this new, uh, new unit of mass, was going to be equal to the mass of water, uh, a volume of water equal to one liter. And what is a liter? It's a cube that has a tenth of a meter on each side. So we've used the definition of the meter to define what we mean by a liter. We've used water, something you know, fairly uh, easily available. Uh, and that was the new definition of the meter. I'm, I'm sorry, of the kilogram. Now, trouble is, it's not that easy <laughs> to get a liter of water. Water sticks to the container, there's a meniscus, you know, the surface is curved, uh, the density of water changes with, uh, with temperature, uh, uh, things that are dissolved in the water can change. Uh, can change its density, all kinds of stuff uh, makes it hard to make this measurement. And it couldn't be done as well as people wanted to measure mass. So guess what they did? They made an artifact. And there it is. <laughs> I'm actually holding it, or at least the box that holds it, in my hand. That is the kilogram of the archives. They made a piece of platinum as close as they could to being the mass of a liter of water. Another problem with water is that the buoyancy of the air changes the apparent mass because you know, it, 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 uh, it creates a little bit of buoyancy. Uh, much less so with platinum, which has a density more than 20 times the density of water. And this became the definition of a kilogram for the country of France as of 1799. Well, remember the 1875, the famous Treaty of the Meter? They decided on making a new kilogram as well. And this is a picture of the international prototype of the kilogram. And the definition of the kilogram up until May 20th of 2019 was that it is the mass of the international prototype of the kilogram. Pretty simple, but it's an artifact. Now, what's the problem with it being an artifact? Well, if someone were to pick it up with their hands, which of course nobody ever would, <laughs> and leave a fingerprint on it, it would mean that all of you would lose weight because everybody's weight is determined in terms of the international prototype of the kilogram. So if you left a fingerprint on it, the kilogram is heavier, but it can't be heavier because it's the definition of a kilogram. It means all of you are lighter not in a way that would help your health any, or that you would even notice, but, uh, but, but nevertheless something that metrologists would worry about. Well, nobody has left a fingerprint on the international prototype of the kilogram, but its mass is changing nevertheless. Here is a plot of the mass of a whole bunch of copies that were made at the same time. So they were made identically uh, to the international prototype of the kilogram, and then from time to time they were measured. They were distributed to all the people who uh, had agreed to make the metric system their system of measurement in 1875. The United States was one of the original signatories of the Convention of the Meter, so we were bound by international treaty to use the metric system ever since 1875, and of course we have. 
so this is the mass of all those kilograms that were given to other people and some that were kept around at the International Bureau of Weights and Measures. Uh, and they change by uh, parts, lots of parts per billion, which is too much for people who are trying to make careful measurements. And you notice that they're all going in the same direction, which makes you think that maybe the problem is that the kilogram itself, the international prototype of the kilogram, is changing in the other direction. But of course, it can't, because by law, whatever the mass of the international prototype of the kilogram is, it's a kilogram. Well, that is unacceptable. In fact, I would say that um, uh, if you have a piece of metal that is, was made in the 19th century based on a piece of metal that was made in the 18th century that you are using as your standard of mass in the 21st century, this is a scandal. And we had to do something about that scandal. And the thing we're going to do is we're going to define a constant of nature that allows us to, uh, uh, to define what we mean by a kilogram. So how are we going to do that? What constant of nature are we going to use? Well, to see that, let me first remind you of what is certainly the most famous equation in all of history, E equals mc squared. What it means is that the energy of an object is equal to its mass times the square of the speed of light. Now there's another expression, not quite as famous. It says that the energy of a photon, which is a particle of light, is equal to Planck's constant times its frequency. Now let's just combine these two equations together and solve for m. It says that the mass is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency divided by c squared. What this means is that if I had a particle, like an atomic nucleus, that emitted a photon, let's say a gamma ray, and you could measure the frequency of that gamma ray, having already defined the speed of light, measuring the frequency, if I now define Planck's constant, just you know, the constant that relates uh, the energy to the uh, uh, to the frequency, if I define that, then I know what that mass change is. So that's sort of the idea of why defining Planck's constant is going to be the way to go. Because if we define Planck's constant, it means we, we know what mass is. Now, we're not going to weigh photons. Actually, we do. It's just that we can't do it well enough. So what I'm going to do now is to describe to you another way in which we can get what we mean by a kilogram from having defined Planck's constant without having to weigh photons, which maybe one day we will if we improve our techniques better. OK, now this comes to something that's also very near and dear to my heart, uh, the interaction of atoms with light. So let's say we have an atom that is at rest in the ground state. Now, we never have atoms at rest. We can certainly put them into the ground state. So now, now I'm talking about energy levels where the lower energy level uh, is, uh, uh, you know, just the, well, it's the lowest energy configuration of all the electrons and, uh, uh, that are in the atom. And then we promote one of the electrons to a higher energy state, so it's orbiting further away from the nucleus. And, uh, and the amount of energy it takes to do that is the energy of a photon particle of light in the visible uh, part of the spectrum, something you could see. OK, so what we do is we start with an atom at rest. There is no such thing, but we can deal with that. <laughs> Uh, we shine in a uh, laser light, and each photon in that laser uh, has an energy, E equals H times F. Those photons also carry momentum, which is kind of remarkable considering the fact that they have zero mass, but, uh, but they carry momentum. That means they're going to give a push to the atom. So when the atom absorbs the photon, not only will the atom go to the excited state, that means its electrons uh, orbiting further away from the nucleus, but also, the atom's going to start moving. And conservation of momentum tells us exactly how fast it's going to move. Because the mass times the velocity of the atom has got to be equal to the momentum of the photon, which is uh, h over lambda. So the atom's going to be moving at a velocity of h over m times lambda. And if we solve for m, then we've got that the mass of the atom is Planck's constant divided by the wavelength 
and the frequency. Now, the frequency is something we know how to measure because we've been measuring it ever since we redefined the meter in terms of, of the, uh, the speed of light. And we're going to define Planck's constant, and we're going to measure the uh, well. We're going to measure the velocity uh, using the Doppler shift of the atom. I forgot this v is the velocity of the atom. The f is the is the frequency. Anyway, what this means is you can make a measurement. It's going to tell you what the mass of the atom is in kilograms. Now, we're used to measuring what the mass of atoms is in atomic mass units. That is, we compare it to the mass of something like carbon. And, uh, and we can do that really well. But now, for the first time, we know what the mass of an atom is in kilograms. Now, the trouble is, it's really small. So we've got to get uh, approximately a gazillion atoms together to make something that's as big as a kilogram. And we've got a way of getting that number, g a gazillion, Exactly, or almost exactly, here is a sphere of silicon, isotopically pure, perfect crystal of silicon. This is the most spherical object ever been made. If this were the size of the Earth, the mountains on here would be about as tall as I am. That's how round this thing is. And it's a perfect crystal. And that means that you can shine in x-rays whose wavelength you can measure beforehand and see what the spacing of the atoms are. And it's all perfectly, no defects in it. So you can essentially count how many atoms are in this sphere. And they do that. They count how many atoms are in this sphere, multiply it by the mass of the silicon atom, which they, which they get from this other experiment that I, was, that I was showing you. And that allows you to know what the mass of that object is to uh, about a part in 10 to the eighth. That is a whole lot less than what those kilograms were drifting around at. So this is definitely the way to go. Now, it turns out that's not the only way to go. This guy, uh, Brian Kibble, came up with an amazing idea for how to do this uh, with an electromechanical device. And, um, uh, well, I'm going to show you a movie of sort of how it works, but I'm not going to explain it in detail because I just don't have enough time, but it's so beautiful. OK, so here is a movie uh, showing how this works. So first, I want you to sort of remember how we weigh things normally. So the way we weigh things normally is we get you know, something on this side of the balance, and then we put known weights on this side of the balance until it balances. And when it balances, then we know what the weight of the unknown weight is by adding up the weights of the known weights. That's, you've all done that you know, in some chemistry lab or some physics lab years and years ago, right? Now I want to invite you to think about a new way, a different way of doing it. Instead of using uh, standard masses on one side, let's uh, uh, create a magnetic field with these, these magnets. Let's have a loop of wire that we're going to put current in. And the force generated on this uh, loop of, of, of wire by the, the magnetic field can be used to balance out the force of gravity on the other side of the balance. And if you knew uh, exactly how much current was going into the coil, and if you knew uh, where all the wires were, and if you knew exactly what this magnetic field was doing, then that would be a perfectly good way of weighing things. The trouble is, you don't know any of those things. Well, maybe you know what the current is in the wire, but you don't know where the wires are, and you don't know what the magnetic field is, and you don't know uh, what direction it's pointing. All of those things can be measured, but not nearly well enough to, uh, to do what you want. And this is where Kibble's genius comes in. So what Kibble says is, OK, let's imagine for this coil suspended in a magnetic field a different kind of experiment. Let's take the leads from that coil, connect it to a voltmeter, and then move the coil. And it'll generate a voltage. This is basically what generators do. Okay? This is how, how people generate uh, electrical power, but we're just going to use it to generate a voltage, and that voltage will depend on how fast uh, this thing is moving, and it'll depend on all those other things that you can't measure very well. So, 
That's what we call the velocity mode. We're going to measure the velocity of the coil, and we're going to see what the voltage is. Then we're going to do what we've already talked about, what we call the weighing mode, where we energize the, uh, the coil with some current that we measure, and we see how much current is needed to, uh, uh, to balance out the mass, uh, but we don't worry about measuring the magnetic field. And the reason is that if we look at the details, we find that if we take the mass that we were using on the force side, multiply it by the acceleration of gravity to give you a force, multiply it by the velocity that you measured from the other experiment, the velocity mode experiment, that's got to be equal to the current from the weighing mode times the voltage generated in the velocity mode. So each side of this equation has stuff from two different experiments. But on this side, you've got something that has the units of mechanical power. And on this side, you've got something that has the units of electrical power. And if you've done everything right, they have to be the same. And so you can solve this equation for the mass, and this tells you what the mass is. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute. Where does Planck's constant come in? And Planck's constant comes in because of these guys, Brian Josephson and Klaus von Klitzing. They uh, discovered, invented uh, ideas that relate uh, voltage to Planck's constant, in the case of Brian Josephson, and von Klitzing uh, related Planck's constant to, uh, to resistance. And this allows you to measure resistance and voltage in terms of Planck's constant. My friends, this fellow right here, Marv Cage, was the one who developed this for the United States of America. After he figured out <laughs> when he saw what von Klitzing did, he said, okay, we're going to do that here. <laughs> and so you can thank the fact that the United States, you can thank him for the fact that the United States got going with this. Okay, so um, we're not going to give you the details. Here is one of the latest machines. Uh, uh, we worked on one of the first machines that didn't look nearly as nice as this one. <laughs> but this is one of the latest machines, and this thing measures uh, kilograms to about a part in 10 to, 10 to the 8th, which is a lot better than what those kilograms were drifting around by. Here is part of the latest team that did that. These people are really serious about metrology because they have tattooed into their arms the values of the fundamental constants based on the measurements that they have made. This is being serious about metrology. When both of these techniques, the kibble balance and the silicon sphere balance, in laboratories all over the world, indicated here by these dots, when they all agreed within a few parts in 10 to the 8th, then it was time to redefine what we mean by a kilogram. And uh, uh, at the General Conference of Weights and Measures in Versailles in uh, November, I think it was, of 2018, uh, the countries of the world who have all signed the uh, International Treaty of the Meter gathered to decide if they would adopt this new definition of the kilogram and the other uh, constants, which I'll talk about very briefly. And when unanimously 60 countries of the world agreed to this redefinition, 60 countries of the world unanimously agreed on something, it almost gives you hope that maybe <laughs> things could get better. <laughs> uh, but it was wonderful, and everybody was happy. And uh, at the end of that, they uh, showed a movie, which I'm now going to show you right now. It took more than 140 years. Groundbreaking science. And the agreement from the world's scientific community. At times, it seemed impossible. Accurate. Precise measurements. Anytime. Anywhere. But we, we did, did it. it. Ce l'abbiamo fatta. We have no special. Lo logramos. Lei si aboli. Congratulations. Congratulations. Super. Parabéns. 
おめでとうおめでとうカムグイウィだオネクショーマグロスキャッパイアイニコフェリシタション Congratulations! It was a great day. <laughs> And uh, uh, the rest of the story is that the ampere is also redefined. It used to be that the ampere was a the current that produced a certain force between wires. And today, the ampere is defined by defining the charge of the electron、uh, in coulombs. And an ampere is just a coulomb per second. So, Uh, an ampere is now one over this number of electrons per second. What could be simpler? What a beautiful、uh, new definition of the ampere.、Uh, but that's not the end. The mole, it used to be that the mole was the amount of substance that had as many molecules as you had carbon 12 atoms in 12 grams of carbon 12. No longer. Today, the mole is just that number. <laughs> That's the number of things in a mole.、Uh, and the Kelvin, it used to be that the Kelvin was 1 over 273.16 of the triple point of water. Now the Kelvin is defined by defining Boltzmann's constant. Boltzmann's constant tells you how much energy, on average, you have in a,、uh, an atom or a molecule that is part of an ensemble that's kept at a certain temperature. So now we have a microscopic understanding of temperature. The, uh, uh, the temperature is just a conversion factor from energy. If I measure the energy of the particles, the atoms in a gas, say, that tells me what their temperature is because I've defined Boltzmann's constant. So a much more beautiful and、uh, microscopic definition of temperature since we understand what the temperature is a microscopic phenomenon.、So, The French Revolution brought us the metric system. It gave us length in, in, in meters and mass in, in kilograms. And the Convention de Metre brought us the international agreement、uh, of, of, the, uh, of the whole world about using metric systems. And then finally, on the 20th of May 2019, which is the anniversary of the signing of the International Treaty of the Meter, We had what I promised you was the biggest revolution since the French Revolution. And so, this、uh, painting of liberty le leading the people means for me that we're finally free of artifacts. We have uh, uh, each of the fundamental constants defined by defining a constant of nature. We have, it appears, realized the dream of the French revolutionaries. That we would have a system of units that we, we, would be good for, for all time and for all people. Except, <laughs> it seems, for time itself. Because time is still based on the frequency of a particular atom. And we now have better atoms and better techniques so that we do not have this situation of being good for all time. For time itself. Now, I understand that you're going to have Dave Wineland coming here uh, uh, a little later. Dave Wineland has measured, oh,、uh, well, okay, it's, it's on two lines. He's measured the frequency of、uh, aluminum ions with an accuracy that is better than a part in 10 to the 18. So, more than two orders of magnitude better than the best we do with cesium. This is one of the candidates that we are now considering as an international community as a,、uh, a replacement for the current definition of time based on the cesium atom. And there are a number of other、uh, atoms and techniques that are in the running, and we're discussing it、uh, right now. I'm uh, uh, attending meetings on almost a monthly basis where we're trying to figure out what is the right thing to do. And so, For the future of time, only time will tell. Everything else looks like it's in pretty good shape. Thank you very much. <laughs> and remember, there are prizes for people who ask questions. And,、uh, and, and so any question. Other than what is the prize, we'll be awarded a prize. <laughs>
And somebody has to run around and, uh, and give people the prizes. Stephen Bassler. <laughs> OK, well, here, let me, uh, let me give you a bunch of, uh, of, of prizes, the people who are going to do the running. <laughs> Yes, ask and, and, and runners, come down and get these things. <laughs> uh, th thank you, Dr. Phillips, for this wonderful presentation. Yeah, one of each. Uh, what, would be, uh, what would be the reason why the United States has done so much progress creating technology <laughs> but has never adopted the metric system like well, every other country? Well, as I mentioned, legally, we did adopt the metric system. We just don't use it. That is, we legally, there is no uh, maintenance of standards of inches and pounds. Inches are, and pounds are defined in terms of meters and kilograms. We do not have standard inches anymore. Uh, so it's really more a matter of using the metric system as opposed to adopting it, at least from a legal point of view. I have to admit, it's a mystery to me as well. You go into the store, and if you want to buy uh, a big bottle of soda, it'll be in liters. But if you buy a big bottle of milk, it's going to be in gallons or quarts, right? But if you buy a little bottle of soda, it's going to be in ounces. Who decided that? Uh, no, so I, I'm, I'm as mystified as you are. I, I, I think it's, it's, it's somehow it's cultural inertia. Uh, but I think it's something we can overcome. In Britain, you know, we use the so-called English system, right? Well, in Britain, they've, they've almost gone over. I mean, if you go into a, a, uh, a pub, you're still going to get a pint of beer. Uh, and by the way, that pint is not an American pint. A, a British pint is 20 ounces, whereas an American pint is 16 ounces. So I had a colleague who used to repeat, uh, you remember Tom Olson used to say that his mother used to say, a pint's a pound the world round. A lie, a pint's a pound only in the US. <laughs> Every place else, like Canada and, and, and the UK, a pint is 20 ounces. So <laughs> uh, yeah, I, it, it, cultural inertia, we just gotta work against it. <laughs> So the prize, by the way, there are two prizes. One is the very best uh, version of the, uh, oh, I guess they're all gone now, there's somebody has them, of the periodic chart of the elements published by NIST. Uh, oh, it's wonderful uh, because it shows you not only the usual things, you know, the atomic mass and the, uh, the, the, the atomic number, but it gives you the electron configuration. It, uh, it's color coded according to which ones are liquids, solids, and gases, and which ones occur naturally or which ones you have to make in nuclear reactions. Oh, it's such a beautiful, a beautiful chart. And the wallet card of the fundamental constants of nature. Not only does this give you the value of things like Planck's constant, the charge of the electron, the speed of light, uh, the fine structure constant, all these things that you need to know on a daily basis, but this is the first card in which this uh, uh, new definition of the SI has been taken into account. So all these constants that used to be uncertain are now exact. We don't have to think about the uncertainties anymore. So it's a great card and a historic document. More questions. Do you know where the artifact of the word second came from? I do not. It, you? <laughs> well, when they broke up an hour into my newts, they, uh, they needed a second order of Swalman's. Ah. <laughs> and, and that came from a book called uh, Calculus Made Easy by J.J. Thompson and updated by Martin Gardner. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, next question. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know exactly, but obviously it's gonna change the weather. And any time uh, you change the weather, you can do things like change the ocean currents. You've probably heard that people are worried that the Gulf Stream is going to change in such a way that either England freezes or... So, so we're going to... Uh, it's worse than that. 
<laughs> from a metrological point of view. Because today, the, uh, and I didn't talk about this, but that frequency for the, the frequency of cesium, there's another dirty little secret behind that. It's defined to be at the position of mean sea level because the gravitational field or gravitational potential changes the ticking frequency of the cesium atom. Now, what does it mean when sea level is changing all the time because of global warming? We, it, it's something we haven't figured out yet. Do we, will we even know what we mean by a second considering the fact that, that sea level is changing? So it's a disaster. Uh, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, there are worse things than metrology that are going to be affected by global warming, but, but just even for metrology, it's a total disaster. Yes. Hi. Um, I want to say thank you for sharing your expertise on um, how we measure everything. I studied history, and I was uh, fascinated by your chronology on how you uh, uh, presented history on how we measure everything. And so Which I'm sure was pretty truncated and uh, <laughs> was yeah. missing a lot of parts. Right, yeah, and that was my question. Um, so my question is, how do we share or honor the stories of non-European oh, scientists yeah. whose contributions are not acknowledged, such as Arab, Asian, Hispan uh, Latin, and indigenous, and African? Um, because stories we tell, it matters, um, at least in the history discipline. And then the follow-up question is, what are your thoughts on the scientific community emphasizing Western and Eurocentric perspectives of studying history, uh, science? Um, and that, because you mentioned uh, about the French Revolution and all that, and two parts on ancient civilization, Egyptians and Babylonians. Um, and you say, for all times, for all people, uh, when I studied history, that kind of contradicts what I was learning in terms of like what was happening during that time, especially during colonialism and imperialism. And so those are my just two questions. And then you finalized that we are free of artifacts, which was really interesting in how we want to not have those standards because it's different for different cultures and history, right? And so I just wanted your uh, perspective on those two questions. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Well, I, I, I certainly agree with you that, that we should be uh, cognizant of and respectful of the, the history of a wide range of cultures. I tried to include a little bit of that, but not nearly as much as I could have. Uh, and uh, so probably in the future, I will try to include more of that. But the, the final result is something that I think we can all celebrate, something that is free of uh, the individual cultures. Now, obviously the richness of those cultures is something we should study, but, but uh, going forward, it's, it's good to be uh, in a situation that is culture-free when we want to communicate among all the different cultures. In fact, the, one of the beauties of this is we could tell people on another planet what we mean by a kilogram. It would have been really hard to do that in the past because we would have said, well, you know, take some platinum. Well, we don't have any platinum. <laughs> or we don't have any of that thing that has that atomic number on our planet, you know. Uh, so uh, uh, now that's not an issue. Uh, so I think the answer is we're all going to try to do better. Okay, thank you. Yes. Why did the weight of the kilogram change? Yeah, why did the weight of the kilogram change? Because, you know, people were, were really careful. I didn't tell you about all the care that people take. But when they handle these kilograms, you know, everybody is, is wearing gloves so they don't leave any, any mark on it. They clean the kilograms before they weigh them according to a certain procedure that's been developed so that everybody cleans their kilograms in exactly the same way. And so why should they be changing relative to each other? And the answer is, we don't know. We simply don't know. And that's one of the beauties of this new definition of the kilogram. We finally have something that we know is stable. So the, one of the first steps in finding out why something changes is to find out how it is changing. We didn't even know that. We just knew how one thing changed relative to another, which isn't the same thing. So now we know, 
or at least once we make new measurements, we will know how each one of those uh, kilogram copies is changing relative to something that doesn't change, namely the new definition, and maybe that will finally teach us what it is that was going on. I mean, what people are guessing is that um, maybe there were slight differences in the manufacture of the kilograms, maybe some uh, entrapped a little bit of gas and that gas is coming out, maybe in the environment in which some of them uh, are stored, maybe there are different kinds of pollutants that don't get cleaned away in the same way. We just don't know, but we're, I'm hoping, going to find out. <laughs> yes? Hi. Uh, two questions. One, how precise is precise enough? It's like, how many digits of pi do we need to memorize? Yeah. How, <laughs> How many digits do we need to go on that? And the second question is a little bit more obscure. A lot of the measurements are based on the speed of light, which is being assumed as a constant, and also a constant in every direction, which some proponents think that there is a, even Einstein in his papers said is a is a matter of convenience that it was chosen to be a constant in all directions. So I don't know if you have a perspective on that, yeah. if it weren't the case, which oh. is not to say that it isn't. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, there's, a, there's at least three questions in there, so I'll try to address, address them. How good is good enough? Well, and the answer to that is depends on what you're doing. What we take it as being our job at NIST is to make it as good as we can. So. Uh, uh, some people would, would be happy to be able to measure mass better than a part in 10 to the 8th, so we're going to keep working. Uh, uh, take something like frequency. One of the reasons why we're so excited about getting better and better frequency standards, basically atomic clocks, is that we can address exactly one of your later questions, which was, are the constants changing? So, so if we take two different atoms, and compare their frequencies, just take their ratio today, and then measure that same ratio a year from now or 10 years from now, if it changes, then we know that something's going on in the fundamental constants of nature. Uh, depending on the atom, it's probably going to be either the fine structure constant, uh, which is a, a dimensionless measure of how strong electromagnetic forces are, or if it's molecules, it might be the ratio of the electron to proton mass that's changing. So far, we haven't seen anything. So far, we can guarantee that from one year to another, these things aren't changing by more than about a part in 10 to the 18. And that the reason we can say that is because people have made atomic clocks that are good to a part in 10 to the 18. Now, let's talk about the speed of light and it changing. Experiments have been done to look to see whether the speed of light is different in different directions. In fact, the Michelson-Morley experiment was one of the, the things that did that. And, you know, depending on which history you read, either that was a motivation for what Einstein uh, did in developing his theory of special relativity or a confirmation that uh, the special, uh, theory of special relativity was, was correct. But, that was only measured to a certain degree of accuracy. So people continue to make measurements like that to verify that, in fact, this assumption that we make, that space is isotropic, uh, that, uh, that things don't change in time, is in fact true. Now, let's talk about changing in time. The trouble with um, thinking about whether the speed of light changes in time is that the speed of light has units. So if it changed in time, what would that even mean? The fact of the matter is that the speed of light cannot change in time legally because we've defined what its speed is uh, and everybody on, on, you know, in, the, in the international metrology community agreed to that definition. So it cannot change because it would be illegal for it to change. Now, it can change in different directions because that's something, you know, that's, that's a ratio, so we can measure that. But to say that maybe the last digit of the speed of light changes, that doesn't actually make any sense. For the fine structure constant, it does, because the fine structure constant is a unitless measure. And therefore, we can make that kind of a measurement, and we are, and so far, doesn't change. But, you know, maybe it will. Maybe we get a little bit better 
maybe we'll see that, uh, that the fine structure constant does change, and that'll be revolutionary. I mean, sure, it'll make all these definitions seem a little bit strange, at least at the part in 10 of the 18 level, which most people don't care about, but it'll open up a whole new direction of investigation in physics if these things are changing. It'll be really exciting if that happens. <laughs> So we're going to take one more question, and then there is the opportunity to uh, ask more questions over the refreshment outside with our distinguished speaker. So, yes. Now, I'm not the only one who's curious, but how long is exactly is the meter of the archives? How long is the meter of the archives? You mean compared to today's meter? Yes. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, I, I think I know who to ask, <laughs> so I will, I will look into that. But my guess is that it's within a few microns. Because, of course, when they redefined the, the meter, uh, they took the best measurement that they had for the old method and uh, made the new one within the uncertainty of the old measurement. So uh, the idea is that no matter how you do the redefinitions, that basically no one will notice because the uncertainty will encompass the, the difference. But what you're asking is meter, well, if you're asking about meter of the archives, that was several changes ago, and it could very well be that some um, uh, improvements in measurement made clear things that people should have been doing back in 1799 that they weren't. Uh, so for example, uh, on a different subject, on the matter of the second, when the second, okay, now I, I sort of lied to you. I forgot, I didn't, I didn't forget, I just decided not to tell you about an intermediate definition of the second, where they defined the second to be a fraction of the year 1900. Now, you might ask, what were they thinking? <laughs> because, I mean, the year 1900 does have the advantage that it doesn't change, <laughs> but it has the disadvantage of that it's not in 1900 right now. But astronomically, you could sort of extrapolate to how long the year 1900 was. Uh, but when they made the definition, which up until then had been based on the mean solar day, they defined the um, uh, the tropical year 1900 on the basis not of what the mean solar day was at that moment, but what the mean solar day had been for the last, I don't know, several years or a couple of decades. And since the Earth had been slowing down, what that meant was that when they redefined the second, they screwed up and defined it not to be, you know, within the uncertainty of what the mean solar day was at the moment, but what the average of the mean solar day had been previously. Uh, you know, they thought, well, average is good, but so what that meant was that there was an automatic initial difference between atomic time and solar time. And as a result, we end up with leap seconds. And so every couple of years, we have to put in a leap second. And it's because of that screw up uh, when they changed the, the definition of the second. So it's not always done with the greatest amount of intelligence. Uh, and right now there's a big discussion as to whether we should just get rid of leap seconds entirely and just let you know, solar time and atomic time just drift apart. And who knows, maybe a couple millennia from now, we'll have a leap hour. <laughs> or a leap minute, or you know something like that. But leap seconds, you know, it, it's, it causes problems. <laughs> well, what a great presentation and fantastic questions. Thank you again, Dr. Phillips. Yeah.